lionfish. So lionfish is another invasive species that's been in the news quite a lot. And I found that the situation with lionfish is not like the silver carp. Silver carp, I think, really would lend themselves to commercial production. You could have boats out there putting this stuff into the food system in a very large way. And that, that would, I think, eventually just about wipe them out. We could use the tragedy of the commons in that way. Lionfish are different. I was, I was surprised. I had a lot of surprises when I went out after these guys. So lionfish are native to the Indian and Pacific Oceans. There are a number of different species of them. And um, they do have sort of a lion-like appearance with what looks like a mane. So each of these spikes here on the, the fins on the side and on the top, each of those has a venomous spike. Now, some people think lionfish are poisonous. Poisonous isn't quite, quite the right word. There's no poison in the meat. But there is a venom that, um, is produced in a little uh, gland at the base of, um, of, of each of these spines. And yes, it is dangerous. Will it kill you? Probably not, but it is a problem. Uh, that said, uh, actually most species of catfish have similar spines. They've just got fewer of, of them with pretty much the same type of venom. I mean, you treat, it's, it's, they're chemically very similar. You're in probably about as much trouble with one as the other. And you, you see catfish you know, sold, or they're calling it swine now, I think. You see catfish for sale in pretty much any grocery store. And it, it's not a unique risk. So we've managed to deal with that risk with catfish. Why can't we deal with it uh, with lionfish? So lionfish were introduced again. It was probably an example of aquarium dumping. There were two separate introductory events. We can tell by looking at the genetic structure of the, prop, uh, of the, of the um, population. Some that were probably dumped from an aquarium before um, uh, a hurricane came in in South Florida, where sp if you have a saltwater aquarium and you're going to be without power for a few days, all those fish are going to die. So we're pretty sure that what happened was it was someone who knew that the power was going to be out and all the fish were going to die, and they were right next to the ocean, so they just dumped them in there. And then there's another population that probably came from, there's a resort in the Bahamas called Atlantis, and they had a whole bunch of these, um, uh, they had a bunch of these fish in their uh, exhibits. And the, actually, the way that their water was processed out, it just went through, really wasn't filtered. So they, would, they, were, they were getting fresh seawater to cycle through their tanks. And um, uh, these guys are egg scatterers. Their eggs, when they release them, they don't stick to something. They sort of scatter out and move through the seawater. And they didn't have filters to prevent the eggs from getting out. So probably, we're pretty sure that what happened, not 100% sure, because they won't let us come in and test their, uh, or they won't let anyone come in and test their lionfish because they don't want the scandal. Uh, but probably what happened is those, we had a separate population from that. Uh, so these guys are really tough. They know, I mean, I don't, I don't intellectually probably not, but behaviorally, they know that nothing can mess with them. And what happens is um, uh, they don't have any real natural predators, and nothing wants to start a fight with them in the Atlantic. Uh, there, every now and then, a really big grouper will come in and eat them. And they also benefit in the Atlantic. They, um, they came along, but their natural um, um, pathogens and diseases and um, <coughs> Um, uh, various um, uh, various you know, bacteria and, and viruses that normally are a problem for them, they're not there. And that actually happens a lot with aquarium dumping. If you have a population in an aquarium, a lot of times if the fish looks sick, people will treat it with antibiotics or something. So if they have, if the if fish is dumped from that, it, it doesn't have maybe the normal parasite load. And a lot of times parasites and disease can cause, can create a natural check on the population in the native habitat. And you put the species out there without those parasites and maybe they've got, so that's one of the things that lionfish have going for them. So I went out to the island of Eleuthera in the Bahamas because there was one particular guy named Mojo White who was really dedicated to killing lionfish and really dedicated to eating them. And I really wanted to work with this particular guy who was so passionate about it. And what I found when I was diving these little patch reefs, um, skin diving, was that um, the, most of the reefs uh, do not look like, we all know what a, a coral reef is supposed to look like. We've all seen documentaries. And, and where the lionfish have become established, it's all you have is lionfish, spiny lobsters, and some little bait fish. You don't have as many grouper. You don't have the yellow tangs and all of these tropical fish uh, because the lionfish eat them when they're young, and, um, and they're, just, you know, they're just voracious. The other impact that lionfish, I think, are having, again, nobody has done good study on this. This is just what I'm getting anecdotally from fishermen that I, that I spent time with in Eleuthera. So what, what are you finding in stomach contents? Wrasses. You know what a cleaner wrasse is. Cleaner wrasses are these little fish that clean up parasites off of other fish. You don't have fish that come from way out in the Atlantic. They'll come and visit these patch reefs, and they'll sit there, and they'll open their mouths, and they'll let the cleaner wrasses come in and pick all of the parasites off of them, and then they go back out into the ocean. It's a really important part of the ecosystem there. Well, lionfish, <laughs> they don't know that they're supposed to clean, leave the cleaner wrasses around. So they'll, they'll sit there kind of guarding a little bit of structure in a coral reef, and a cleaner wrasse will come up, you know, ready to get to work, and the lionfish just eats it. 
So what's the effect of that going to be in, in 20 years or so? You've got to figure parasite loads are going to go up on all kinds of fish from the Atlantic that come in there. And um, I don't know what the result of that's going to be. It's not good. I mean, you could have some, you know, some fish that's normally 2,000 miles away that just visits once a year where the population could crash out of nowhere because of the parasite load. You know, we, just, we just don't know. You cannot drag a net through the water and get a lot of these. They live in, um, th they tend to stay uh, really close to structure. So they'll be in, you could catch, they would take a, a hook, but you're not going to be able to get the hook in there to present it because it's going to be back in a little alcove somewhere. And the only effective way to fish for these is one at a time with a spear, which you might think, okay, you, how do you commercialize that at all? Well, actually, um, most of red lobster's lobster that they sell is not main lobster, it's spiny lobster, and most of it comes from the Bahamas. And in the Bahamas, you can't use lobster traps the way that they you know haul them up out of the water and dump them in the boat you know uh, off the coast of you know Maine or Massachusetts uh, the way that you have to hunt them there legally is they can't use scuba deer they have to snorkel and they have to go down and spear each 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 of these um, lobsters one at a time so you've already got a whole system where people are down there with spears stabbing things one at a time and you've got a cold chain to get this stuff from the Bahamas all the way to um, to markets in North America. If you give these guys a price per pound that's even remotely close to the um, uh, to that of the lobster, then you know they'll, they'll do it. And in fact I was really, I think we have a, okay, there's supposed to be a video here of me uh, underwater stabbing a, a lionfish but uh, it is not, uh, that slide is, or that video is not working on this machine. Uh, it, it tasted delicious. I was just, I was really, this is one of the biggest surprise when I, for su surprises, when I ate fresh lionfish, it had a bright, uh, just a really bright flavor. The texture was like Chilean sea bass, or at least what, things that I've been told were Chilean sea bass when I ate them. And it, it was, um, I was amazed at how good it was. I think this is something, if you put it on the menu and make a big deal out of it, uh, I think you can charge a lot of money just because people will know, okay, you're doing something that this may be good, good for your, you're gonna feel good about yourself. If you're eating lionfish instead of uh, Chilean sea bass, this is something you could put on menus, you could charge per pound what you charge for Chilean sea bass. If you're a restaurateur, I think there's enough awareness of it. There, it, it is possible to source the fish. Uh, there are a couple of restaurants that are serving it now. Um, I did a dinner in New York City once uh, where we got a bunch of chefs to come in and try it. And there are at least a couple restaurants in New York that are serving it. There's uh, a few places in Miami. So it's, it's getting somewhere. But even without that market, okay, so I told you what the, what the patch reefs look, what most of the reefs look like. Well, I also dove some patch reefs that Mojo and his buddies had been hitting pretty regularly. Like a couple times a month, they would go and hit those patch reefs. And those ones that they had been fishing regularly looked like a proper coral reef. I mean, you had that diversity of fish of all different colors, and I won't say there were a ton of grouper there, but you had real diversity. You, you saw, just at a glance, there was, a, there was just a lot more fish there. And this was just from you know, this group of five or six buddies that would go out there on their boat and stab lionfish together and, and eat them, and they would do this just as small. And so you're talking about like a five-acre patch reef. And that's really kind of profound because, okay, if you've got species that could be eaten to extinction, uh, or local extirpation by the lionfish. Look, we can't get rid of, we don't have a way to get rid of every lionfish. If we, even if we had a commercial fishery all up and down the Atlantic coast, and we will have them in Virginia Beach probably in the next 10, 15 years, it will happen. Uh, but we, they, they will be able to survive there. They're already established breeding populations in North Carolina already. Uh, or off the coast of North Carolina. But the point is, we can't get rid of the lionfish completely on our own. But you know, a lot of times, an invasive species won't make it on its, on its own. You'll have something that looks like it's going to take over the world and then doesn't. Like, I don't know if anybody remembers 20 years ago, gypsy moths were supposed to destroy the planet. And in part, it was the gypsy moths just didn't have the stain power. They weren't able to deal with, like, you know, with the natural cycles of things that, that happen in the habitat for a long time, and it was human inter intervention. Or look at green iguanas in central Florida, which were really taking over, and then they had a cold snap a few years ago, and they were dying in the trees and just falling out of the trees like, like dead meaty fruit. Uh, the black spiny tails, well, iguanas, that won't work with them because they go underground. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll get away from the cold. But so these green iguanas look like they were taking over. Well, you know what? Every 50 years or so, you get a real hard cold snap like that in Florida, and the native um, uh, the native reptiles have adapted to that. Or you have you know cycles in um, in terms of flooding and in terms of maybe um, uh, uh, in insects or, uh, or or diseases that might have 20 or 30 or 50 year cycles. So sometimes, if you just wait. Sometimes an invasive species could disappear on its own. Maybe 10 years from now, the stink, stink bugs will finally be gone. So my point is, 
that if you protect a few of these little patch reefs, you've got something to bounce back. So maybe there's some place, hey, you know what? <coughs> Mojo White can't do something about all of the, the lionfish in the Atlantic, but he can say, this is my little reef, and I'm going to have this one place where the cleaner wrasses survive. And what's the difference between losing 100% of a species and 99%? Well, huge. You know, I mean, I guess in some cases, 1% isn't enough to genetic diversity to recover from. But if you've got a few little populations, maybe if we can just have a few people who are really dedicated to killing lionfish, you can have these patch reefs where some of these species can bounce back from. If lionfish die from some disease 50 years from now, maybe you get a, 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 a tanker from you know, the uh, Indian Ocean comes with ballast water that comes out and introduces a disease that kills all the lionfish. Okay, great. But do we have these, these species that are in trouble right now? Do you have something to recover from? And I think that's kind of profound. I think that's true in your own backyard. If you've got an acre either of, of habitat that you could say, I'm going to get the invasive plants out of here. I'm going to pull all the dandelions out. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get rid of the honeysuckle, which is, a, which is another invasive species. If you just have your little bit of habitat, and you may not be able to do anything about this problem overall, but you can say, I'm going to hunt this invasive fish or lizard or whatever it is, that that could be pretty powerful of just having a few people, even if you can't create a market for it. Sometimes, you know, you, you can you can just do that on your own. And uh, my last uh, example here, this is a Chinese mystery snail. This is a species found in, uh, it's native to Asia, and it's found in Albemarle County. There are at least three sites in Albemarle uh, where they're found. This is another uh, example of aquarium dumping. People will use these to, cl to, uh, to clean their um, koi ponds often. They'll sell, they'll, any place that sells koi will often have these and they'll use them for, uh, for aquariums also just to sort of clean the algae off the side. And they get like this big, they get pretty big. There's uh, somebody, some idiot dumped a bunch of them in a pond on Monticello's property uh, where they asked me to stop gathering them. Uh, and then there's another, um, there's another population uh, at Tatcha Creek uh, Reservoir near Scottsville. And I've been gathering them up there quite a lot. So if, some years ago I discovered this population and it's actually, there's about two miles of stream uh, of, of Totcher Creek separating where this population is, where they're dumped near a parking area, and uh, the James River. What's going to happen if they get into the James? You know, you're again, much like the silver carp, it's something that eats at the bottom of the ecosystem. And then actually, in the, every, every bit of water where I found these guys, I do not see native snails. They do seem to, appre to, uh, to displace uh, the, the, the native snails that, that really belong there. What are the ecological effects of this going to be in you know, 30, 40, 50 years? I don't know. Almost nobody's studied them. There's been a little bit of research that was done on them in Oregon. But nobody's looked at that at it in Virginia, really. There haven't been any exhaustive studies. We don't know what the effect of it is going to be. And the really frustrating thing is r right now you can get rid of them. You know, they're these isolated populations. And for years I've been sounding the alarm trying to get some government agency to come in there. And we can bomb that with rotenone or with a chemical that will kill just about everything else in there. But again, there's nothing endangered there right now that we would lose completely. It'll, it'll bounce back. We could go in there and we could bomb it and we could get rid of these snails and, um, uh, and, and you may, maybe save the Rivanna and James Rivers from this invasion. Nobody's doing anything. So meanwhile, you know, a couple times a month, I go out to Totcher Creek and I roll my pants up or I wear a swimsuit and I've got a bucket and I pick them up one at a time. And, you know, is that a permanent solution? No, but I think it's something that, um, it's just an example of what any one of you can do. If you decide, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step up to the plate. Again, global warming and habitat loss, lots of people, I don't know what you as an, you, can, if you feel good when you put something in the recycling bin, I guess, but you know, if you wanna do something to stop extinction, you can be you know, that person like Mojo, stabbing the lionfish one at a time or picking up the Chinese mystery snails, and I think one person really can make a really big difference. So that's the last slide for today. Anybody have any questions?